it's World Suicide Prevention Day, which kind of blindsided me, which is a bit unusual because I'm usually fairly up on these things, you know, I, I have a pretty vested interest in them, unfortunately. Um, and there's a few things I want to talk about, so this video is likely to run long and be very boring and serious and, you know, about difficult topics and emotion and, and so on, so I'm not exactly expecting it to do well. But that's kind of the first thing that I want to talk about. The fact that this video, or any video, about suicide, about self-harm, about depression, mental illness, and so on. The fact that any video like that gets demonetized on YouTube or you know, otherwise is sanctioned by social media companies, this is a problem. Now, obviously, I'm not doing it for the money. <laughs> when I talk about depression and issues, it's because I want to, I want to help people. But to understand why this is a problem, you have to understand how demonetization works and, and operates within the, the YouTube system. So if I make a video that contains taboo topics that gets demonetized, that isn't considered advertiser friendly, it doesn't just mean that no revenue is created, right? It doesn't just mean that adverts aren't served to your video, though a handful still might be. It also means you get downlisted, de-ranked, that your video does not appear more readily on searches and so on. And this is a double standard because when corporations decide to talk about depression or suicide or LGBT issues or whatever else it might be, they get different treatment to your average, hopefully more relatable person like me talking on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook or wherever wherever else it might be. Versions of this problem happen everywhere, right? So those of us who put ourselves out there and talk about these kind of subjects get deranked. Our videos don't get served up to, to, be, to people. And if you want to help others on social media dealing with these issues, if you want to talk frankly and openly and honestly about depression, about suicide, about self-harm, about any of these topics, People aren't going to find you. People who need help aren't going to find you. It becomes incredibly hard to build a community of people to talk about these things because you are specifically prevented from finding each other. And this isn't happening because of human intervention per se, it's happening because of algorithms. So it's not even in human hands, and very often you can't even get hold of a human being on these, on these platforms. So they're, they're inherently dehumanizing. The fate of your video, your comment, your post, your, your blog, whatever, is determined by mathematics that nobody really understands how they work anymore because they're all learning algorithms, right? And a lot of these companies are perfectly happy to well, in the LGBT instance, to, to plaster rainbows on everything to make a quick buck. But they don't actually care about LGBT issues. And similarly, there are companies that will make a big song and dance about, about mental health, about depression, about suicide, about self-harm and so on, to show how socially aware and responsible they are, while at the same time refusing to advertise or, or monetize or you know, otherwise interact with material that actually materially deals with these subjects um, and, and tries to help people. So there's a whole lot of hypocrisy and uh, you know, I appreciate you don't want snuff videos of people killing themselves on Facebook Live or whatever else and I appreciate that you don't want to see people cutting or showing off their cuts or whatever but these things are often cries for help as well. So by removing them you're often stopping people getting the help that they need. It's, it's a difficult topic, it's a difficult issue, but I would tend to come down on the side of, I would rather these people got help than a few people got offended or squicked out, right? <laughs> that, that, that's what I would prefer. And there's also charities that produce material on YouTube and other places. They should be considered trusted sources, obviously, but they're gonna be running into the same problems. 
and charities need all the revenue that they can get so if they're producing videos on YouTube they should be able to monetize them and get adverts served on them and get money that they can then plow back into directly helping people so the, the current regime the current dehumanizing inhuman mathematical derpy AI that we have running everything is just manifestly unsuited to these issues and I think it's incumbent upon YouTube and others to understand that and find workarounds or to change the way that the whole system operates to prevent this kind of hypocrisy that we're increasingly seeing on these platforms but it is frustrating and off-putting to me when I want to help people that whenever I do yeah I'm, I'm hobbled right from the start due to the due to the title the content and everything and I don't want to obfuscate what I'm talking about behind other stuff and it's not just me it's anyone who wants to talk about this this kind of thing ends up with the same problem and it's not helpful and it certainly doesn't help prevent suicide if there's one thing all this depression has, has taught me it's that I would never be a good assassin you know, the easiest target to kill must be yourself <laughs> and I've failed at that something like five times now Right, so there there is no future for me as a, as a globe trotting assassin or a, or a double O agent or anything like that. I can't even manage to off myself. So clearly, I'm, yeah, there's no career there for me, whatsoever. What has stopped me, though? What what has prevented me from taking my life in those instances? And I'm trying to think back now. Some of these, well, one at least, two, were before I was ever diagnosed with depression and were much more situational. Right? It's stupid teenage bullshit. Oh, my, my girlfriend left me. I don't want to live anymore, sort of, sort of thing, right? And one of them, my body just kind of utterly rejected my attempt. Right, I was trying to, to, to drown myself, essentially, and uh, my body wanted to live, and I couldn't force myself to the, to the extent that I needed to, so just physically I wasn't able. Um, I was depressed to that point several times, and another thing that stopped me was the fact that it was such a god-awful cliché. And I know that's, that sounds stupid, right? But um, I find the, the depression to be a terrible cliche as well. <laughs> Just think, you know, here's me, the the uh, gothabilly sort of artsy writery type, and uh, w with depression and uh, with with suicidal depression, and it's such a horrendous stereotype. I would never write it for a character. <laughs> <laughs> in, in anything and I just find it kind of embarrassing and I think that's kind of helped me back a bit yeah, if I'm going to die it's not going to be a cliche god dear absolutely not no so yeah there, there's that it sounds laughable but it is it is something that, that has certainly helped um, inexperience uh, not knowing what I was doing um I think in the age of the internet, everyone knows now that if you slit your wrists, you're supposed to do it downwards, not across, right? Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see, but if it zooms in, uh, no, I don't know if you can see, but there is a there is a scar there on my wrist uh, from where a craft knife bit in and hit the bone. <laughs> then that's what stopped me it's going side to side um, it's really hard to see because it's really pale but there is a you can see the bite in ah oh, there it is okay you can see the bite in mark there right and you can see a very faint line going across because it hit the bone and then skimmed across the surface of the skin and just left me with a very very light scar on my wrist so that was yeah inexperienced that was one 
Um, not the time I was going to throw myself in front of a train. What stopped me there was two things. Um, I was using the excuse of going to attend a friend's funeral um, as, as a reason to be at the train station and to, and to be travelling. And I didn't want to inflict another death on my friends at the time. And uh, an old friend of mine once witnessed uh, a train suicide, unfortunately. And um, this is a guy who was pretty much unshook by anything, um, kind of skirted the edge of criminality through much of his life, saw a lot of heavy shit, and that left him kind of pale and, and shaking and not himself for weeks, just, just kind of witnessing it. So I didn't want to do that to anyone. So that's what stopped me there. Um, another slit wrist attempt was in, was in the bath. By that time I knew what I was doing. And having a pet stopped me because suddenly there was a pet at the door caterwauling and scratching. Animals can sense when you're ill or something's wrong very often, I find. So having a pet stopped me. What can you take from all this? Um, having people or animals that are dependent on you or who value you, even when you don't value yourself, people that you care about and you don't want to put through hell, I think that's 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 the main takeaway here is to maintain human connections and people say the internet is somehow removing our connections to one another but I found the opposite admittedly my situation is unusual I work for myself I work from home the internet is often the only way that I have to interact with other human beings but it has been invaluable on that score and having people to talk to and having the opportunity to talk places like this yeah that's that certainly helped. So those are the things that stopped me. It's going to be different for everybody. And people try different things. And some of these were more of a cry for help or kind of dare to myself, I suppose. So there's that aspect as well. It's not always because someone genuinely wants to kill themselves, but that's more true of women than men. But we'll get to that in a bit. I covered self-harm a bit in a recent video, and um, I, I explained some of my sort of experiences with it and um, how I felt it was perhaps being a little bit unfairly demonized so I don't want to go on too much here so I'll kind of, I'll try and try and keep it short now, again I don't know if you can see it's a little bit more visible it's got a little bit of a tan uh, this summer but there's a few scars there on my arm I don't know I don't know how well you can see them um, in self-harming, I've never particularly cut myself particularly deeply, so um, there isn't a lot of a lot of scars. Self-harm for me, and it's different for everyone. It's a stalling technique, right? We all have ways that we deal with depression. A lot of people self-medicate with drugs or drink or sex, or lashing out, getting into fights, whatever else it might be. Anything to stave off that feeling, right? This is part of the reason that I think depression should be compared with grief, not sadness, right? There's a, there's a feeling of helplessness that comes with depression, and lots of people act out when there's nothing that they can do, right? So with grief, someone is dead, you cannot bring them back, you cannot do anything about it, all you have is this pain and there is nothing you can do. So often people drink, or they turn to drugs, or they lash out, or whatever, when it comes to grief, 
and the same sort of behaviors happen with depression so I, I think grief is a much better analogy or point of comparison right so that that's one thing I want to get out of the way and for me self-harm is a deflection behavior so I have like fallbacks I'll try and distract myself with games or I'll try and get into arguments on the internet or whatever because I would rather be angry than depressed I'd rather be angry than grieving right and so, as you get closer and deeper in that depression to the point of wanting to end yourself not having any way to deal with this this pain that you feel self-harm is a way of forestalling that depression it takes all that emotional pain and it turns into something physical and real something that is comprehensible something that will heal something that will visibly heal and something that hurts physically in a, in a real tangible way so that's that's what it is for me now there's a lot of concern and worry about self-harm um, and that certain sites and so on might might promote it but I think there is something valuable in having people who self-harm come together share tips on cleaning up the scars keeping the wounds clean not getting them infected how to cut without doing yourself serious damage and harm right that there is there is value in that because it's a fallback position and there are other deflecting behaviors that you can do that can work in the same way like clutching ice cubes in your hand till it really hurts you know that's something that they recommend as an alternative to cutting but some people are going to cut and as and when they do i want them to do it in the, in the safest way possible that's going to leave the least scars and so on now for me this is an absolute fallback position because i've known people who self-harmed i have some sympathy with the the idea that you don't want this to be a cool thing that the kids do you don't want it to be peer pressure and so on because back in the 90s it kind of was about the same time that every girl you met was a bisexual, right? Or at least claimed to be. There, there are trends. I think the trans trender thing is a little bit similar. I also think there's some genuine people, non-conforming people who are getting swept up in all this and being lost in the crowd of people who are being a little bit disingenuous. And the same thing happened with self-harm and the same thing happened with bisexuality. In the 90s, there was a bit of a trend. There was controversies around myspace and so on you know the early days of social media and, and blogs and so on so i have some sympathy for that but if people are going to hurt themselves i would rather they did it in a safer cleaner better way and for me and i'm sure for a lot of other people it is a deflecting behavior another part of the reason that i don't do it that much and why it's kind of like the final the final hurdle before I succumb to suicidal feelings is because I've known people who've seriously self-harmed particularly one really beautiful girl unconventionally beautiful but beautiful incredibly talented girl that I knew as part of the Camarilla LARP Society who absolutely lacerated themselves and it was always heartbreaking to see her turn up to a game with bandages or fresh scars or whatever else because it's of someone I held in, in such such regard um, and went out of my way to, to try and make their, their times more enjoyable when they were out, out with us and everything because of this <laughs> you know because it was just heartbreaking and I know other people would feel the same well not that I'm beautiful but you, you get what I mean if if I was that scarred or that hurt or cut myself that often right but I think for most people, it's a displacement behavior similar to me. And I would much rather that they hurt themselves than kill themselves. Suicide is a huge issue for marginalized groups, right? I'm sure we're all used to hearing about how trans people are more likely to commit suicide. You know, there's an enormous amount of societal and social strain on certain people. What may surprise you, though it shouldn't, is that suicide really disproportionately affects men. 
women attempt suicide more often, men succeed more often to the point where, depending where you live, but this is fairly consistent everywhere around the world, men commit suicide at a rate between three and five or six times as often as women. And this is particularly the case in more modern, civilized, I know that's a trigger word for some people, but more modern, civilized, uh, progressive, egalitarian, developed nations, right? That, that's where it's a huge issue in particular. And now I'm not saying we need to roll anything back, I'm just saying we need to acknowledge the problem, we need to tackle and deal with it. Men commit suicide at about the rate of 17 in every 100,000 per year. That's based on last year's stats and that's up to since the previous year's stats. So 2017, about in the UK at least, about 15 in every 100,000 men um, killed themselves and then last year about 17 in every hundred thousand men killed themselves now unfortunately it's also rising amongst women and so on but it is still primarily a men's issue like homelessness is and like homelessness I believe it's because in part that there is a lot of provision and a lot of work done to help women but that same support network, that same set of efforts, that same amount of charity work and money and so on isn't being directed at the male suicide issue. And that speaks to some fairly deep, and I suspect um, evolutionary psychology as the basis, it, it speaks to some very deep things that are in, in our biology, in our evolutionary ancestry and so on, uh, but also in our societies and the way in which we order ourselves and the things that we do. Just because something is natural doesn't mean it's the best way to do, to do things. Just because something happens in nature doesn't, doesn't make it right, you know? Diseases are natural, right? But we, we fight disease. Cancer is natural, but we try to find cures for that. Murder and cannibalism and infanticide and so on happen everywhere throughout nature, but we regard these things as, as unacceptable. I think I think Dawkins has said something like that, you know, it's understanding evolution, understanding the, the forces of natural selection and so on, doesn't mean that we have to conform to it. It doesn't make it something that we have to go along with. So the idea of men self-sacrificing or necessarily utterly prioritizing women it's it's not something we have to go along with we can improve upon nature we can be better than nature it's just that we're fighting nature in order to do so but then yeah look at all the technology we have and social structures are just another form of technology it's another tool right? education is a, is a tool um the law is a tool and these are social constructions that have no physical reality save as, as encodings in our brain and on paper right so we could develop tools and we already have tools which are much more suited to dealing with men and their mental health issues right now i have to belabor this point unfortunately but i don't regard myself as a men's rights activist i regard myself as an egalitarian right but I think there are a lot of men's issues, in particular mental health. My own biases might be speaking there since I'm a sufferer myself. But those are the things that I think are being left behind as we have reformed and shifted and changed our society over the last, well, 50 years or so, I guess, since the 60s and 70s. That's where you've got the, the sexual revolution, women's liberation, all the rest of it. But we haven't had a commensurate level of investment in men and unfortunately the narrative that we have around men when it comes to suicide and mental health issues isn't good and i think this is misidentifying the problem even the telegraph um you know the, the tory graph fairly right-wing fairly conservative fairly traditionalistic um 
as, as broadsheets go. Even they today have a have an article that is essentially blaming men for their own self harm and suicide rates and so on. It's it's the same old thing trying to treat men as if they're damaged women. So saying that men need to need to open up more, and we need to apply the same solutions to men that we have to women. But I believe, at least in part, our psychologies are different. And I'm saying this as an unconventional, not particularly masculine man, beard notwithstanding. Because even though I see myself as, as unconventional and perhaps more in touch with my feminine side in a lot of ways, I've been through the UK's mental health system. I've been to therapists of various kinds. And I don't think our approach is working. And I don't think diagnosing men as broken women works any better than it would be to diagnose women as broken men. And I will bang this drum until the day I die because I really think we need different approaches. So I've done videos on this before, I've touched on it a lot before. I could go on for hours about this and probably will. <laughs> but right now I just want to focus on, on one thing. So there's often this call for men to open up about their emotions, right? Now I think there is a, a deep-seated evolutionary psychological reason why we don't. And I think that is either reinforced or expressed by the society in which we live. So men are deeply uncomfortable with opening up about their emotions and showing vulnerability in a way that women aren't. To some extent that's biology, I believe, your, your mileage may differ, and to some extent it's societal. We can correct somewhat by changing the societal tools we have, but I don't think we can completely overcome nature without a few thousand years of evolution or s some, some fairly harsh genetic intervention which might happen in the future, who knows. But typically these, um, these talk therapy sessions, for example, last about a half an hour. Uh, and you go in and you sit down and there's some gently probing questions to try and get you talking about whatever it is that's bothering you. Now I found, despite being an unconventional man, that I found it very difficult to, to open up in that allotted time. So at least half that period would be spent prying open the clamshell of my feelings <laughs> to allow me to to disgorge them and, and to talk about them and discuss them and we never really had any solutions particularly there were there were tools for processing your emotions and so on which were more masculine and that was more useful so the intellectualization exercises but the talk therapy itself the unburdening was very difficult and i didn't open up very quickly no matter how many times I went back, there was always, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of eh, 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 trying to open me up. And I've taken the opportunity to talk to the various therapists and psychologists that, that I've uh, been referred to. And they all say the same thing, that women tend, you know, this is on average, tend to open up much more quickly. And so they get a lot more out of the session. Whereas with men, often it wasn't until the very end of the session <laughs> that they were opening up at all. And I think that is a, a gender difference. And I think it's something we need to account for when it comes to the therapeutic offerings that we offer. Now, I love the NHS very much. I want to keep it, but it's one size fits all. It's cognitive behavior therapy for everyone. And that's it, right? And that's mostly talk therapy and a few tools that I did find useful, but still. That's much less helpful for men than it is for women, I think. There are alternatives, there's like the, the Men's Shed movement, um, Mind as a charity in the UK, they have meetings where people get together and they they fix things, you know, not particularly helpful for me either, but for a lot of men, these kind of things, sort of working side by side, forming friendship bonds, and then slowly opening up to each other over a much longer period of time, that seems to be a lot more useful and a lot more effective, but it's not something that gets offered. And it's something that's either oversubscribed and run by charities, which is a problem, 
Um, or to get decent therapy, you have to go private, and that's very expensive. I was fortunate. Um, my family helped me out. I saw a, uh, a guy who specialised in male psychology and was, uh, without going into too much detail, kink aware, shall we say, so wasn't judgmental of anything on that side at all, which is a thing I've struggled with throughout my life since since puberty. And he was very useful, but even after a while that stopped being useful. So you need a variety of approaches, you need tailored approaches, and you need to acknowledge the gender differences and to tailor the approach to better suit the gender of the person who needs help. And I think you need to acknowledge that men feel don't just feel vulnerable when they open up, they feel under threat. Right? In a way that women perhaps don't. It's disarming, it's emasculating, uh, and it doesn't do anything to help your mental health to feel weak and vulnerable and like you could be attacked at any moment. And even I, as an unconventional artsy-fartsy bloke, found it very difficult to push past all that. And we need to acknowledge that there is a there is a male problem around suicide and other related issues and we need to tackle it with male-centered approaches but that's just not going to happen in the in the social atmosphere that we have now and when bringing this up is treated as incel mra misogynistic whatever it's it's not and men are dying and nobody seems to care and that's really really heartbreaking and disheartening. This has gone on an incredibly long time for, for an unscripted video, uh, but I want to try and end on a positive. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. I think if we are going to deal with these issues, if we are going to genuinely prevent suicides, then we need to make changes to our societies as important and fundamental as the ones we have made around race, as the ones we have made around women's liberation and, and feminism, um, as the ones we've made around LGBT. Um, on the plus side, this will benefit everybody rather than just one select group, but on the negative side, I think we are just blind to a lot of the problems around this, the importance of self-worth and the different ways in which people derive their self-worth up until probably the turn of the turn of the millennium, right? Everyone's gotten their primary identity from what they do, their their work, their role. That's got to change. And sooner rather than later, we need to find something inherent in ourselves without succumbing to identity politics that we can find worth in as individuals. And I, I think that's where the ultimate key to solving this lies. But, like I say, I, this has gone on a very long time, very unscripted, rambling, um, but I do want to end on a positive note. So what can we do, what, what can you do that would help people like me and prevent us from doing ourselves in? Though as we've already covered, I'm pretty incompetent at doing so, so I'm probably okay. <laughs> understand it, understand depression, understand what drives people to suicide and self-harm. At those rates that, that I've quoted, I mean, most people have a, a, a sphere of friends and acquaintances that's yeah, around 100 people that they really interact with regularly. So odds are we're all going to experience someone at least that close to us dying of the, from their own hand in our lifetimes. So there's probably people that you know or, you know, just two degrees of separation from you. So show an interest in that, what what drove them to that, and try and look for those signs and so on in others. Befriend people. 
take make, make the effort to put some positivity out into the world right everything is so relentlessly negative you always hear the bad things about anything you've done and you so rarely hear the good things and even when you do hear the good things you don't pay as much attention to them as the bad so we would need to drastically increase the amount of positive feedback appreciation and love that we put out into the world to compensate but any small amount matters let's so just take take the time get a post-it note right say something nice and, and slap it up and just whenever you have a spare moment and you're reminded send someone a positive message i've started doing that <laughs> quietly on the sly um and it makes me feel better to put something positive out rather than to just be relentlessly negative and nitpicky with people so you, you know you benefit from that as well from putting positivity out into the world i'm not saying like airy fairy new age vibes or, or whatever just on a human level knowing that you are appreciated and that what you do matters to people is it's a lift <laughs> if you can get through to someone Make sure you keep your friend bonds strong. We all drift apart as we get older, as we move away, as we get families and we become a lot more insular. But make the effort there to maintain contact. Just a, just an email once a month. Say, hey, how are you? What's going on? This is what I've been up to. You know? Something like that. That's something men tend to fail more on as well. That, that sense of connection. So make the effort there. And that, that that's... That's it on a personal level. What we can do is is maintain and retain our bonds of friendship and caring and openness with each other, with people you can trust. That you don't have to build up to trusting as you would with a therapist. You know, friends, the kind of friends who would help you bury your body. These are important people to have in your life. And on a societal level, donate to, to mental health charities, particularly men's mental health charities, put pressure on government try to find people who are less kooky and less objectionable to champion these kinds of causes again particularly for men but but for everyone but when philip davies is arguing your corner i think that's a handicap as much as an advantage and when the Justice for Men and Boys party is arguing your corner, I think that hobbles you as much as it might give you a profile. It's a, it's a horrible adult realisation, but you've got to play the political game and you've got to find the acceptable face of whatever it is that you're trying to push for. And I think that is the next step of maturity that needs to emerge around these issues. And complain to places like YouTube, like Facebook, like Twitter, that they're doing more harm than good by removing voices. So just the last thing I would say is, well, this video is too long and rambly, so don't share this one. <laughs> but find someone's blog or post or video or something about World Suicide Prevention Day and signal boost it because the big social media companies, sure as fuck, aren't going to do so. Love you all. Take care, everyone. Zang. I hate a lot, you know? <laughs> but I hate with style and creativity. <laughs> yeah!